Welcome into other people's shoes. As you know, I am your host, Neil Matthews. Thank you so much for joining me today. Really excited that you've decided to hit play today. Before we get to our guest, got a little bit of an announcement to make. So today's guest is really amazing. He has a fantastic name. If you haven't seen it in the show notes already, his name is Neil. And today, actually today, is his birthday. So help him out, go over to his social media, go over to his website and just send him a little birthday greeting saying, hey, Neil, happy birthday. I don't know about anybody else. Birthdays are super special. Without further ado, here is Jessica Lewis. She is a voice actress and she is voicing our beginning of our show. So Jessica, without further ado, take it away. Welcome into Other People's Shoes, the podcast where listeners get to step into the lives of others and see the world through their shoes. Your host, Neil Matthews, is a seasoned interviewer who has a natural talent for empathizing with his guests and drawing out their unique perspectives. Through a combination of storytelling and insightful questioning, Other People's Shoes explores the lives of a diverse range of guests, from everyday people to celebrities and thought leaders. With a warm and welcoming style, Neil creates a safe and supportive space for his guests to share their stories, while also challenging listeners to broaden their perspective and think more deeply about the world around them. So tune in to Other People's Shoes with Neil Matthews and get ready to step into other people's shoes. Hey, come take a walk with me, not like you used to do. Do something different and put yourself in other people's shoes. Open up your mind and open up your eyes and change your direction, change your perspective. Welcome in to Other People's Shoes. As you know, I am your host, Neil Matthews. Thank you for hitting play today. Listen, you could you could be out playing a round of golf, which, uh, which I did the other day, by the way, with some friends of mine. And I took pictures along the way because some firsts happened for me. So I'll, I'm going to share my golf story here now. First thing that happened is on a tee shot, I hit the green. Now, mind you, we're playing a par three, so they're not very long for those golf enthusiasts out there. You're like, well, how far was it? It was just a par three, so calm down. With a seven iron also, by the way. And I still ended up bogeying the hole because I can't putt to save my life. What's funny about golf to me is it's this elusive game that no matter how much I try, no matter how much I fret, worry, do all the fundamentals and watch YouTube videos and watch guys on Instagram that I just seem to not be able to put it all together at the same time. Like one day I'll have a great drive and then the next day I can't putt. Or the next day I can't drive, but I can putt really well. Or the next day I'm, I'm still struggling with teeing it just right or going off to the left or going off to the right. Now, some of you that are not golf enthusiasts are like, what What relevance does that have for us today? Well, let me tell you, because I think I've been putting on this mask, this veneer, this facade that I can look the part. I can get the golf shoes. I can get the golf polo. I can even get the golf visor, but I'm never going to be no Tiger Woods. No Jack Nicholas, no Greg Norman. I'm not going to be any of those guys. I've been trying to be a golfer or pretend to be a golfer. I wonder how that relates to what we're talking about today. Well, help me welcome in my guest from the Show Me State. I think that's still their nickname. Now, we might have to talk Cardinals baseball here for a minute, too. But help me welcome in my new friend. And it might sound weird to you guys, but his name really is Neil. And it is even spelled correctly. Welcome in my new friend, Neil. Neil, how are you? Neil, it is great to be here. And uh, by the way, (laughs) I totally relate to your golf story. I actually... Last week had my first birdie ever, but you know how I got it. I had to chip in to avoid putting because if I would have gotten it on the green, I would have like five putted from 10 feet. So many years ago, we were at this janky and and janky's being polite, janky golf course here in my area called Bear Creek. And so now I just lost that sponsorship opportunity. (laughs) We were playing towards the end of the night and sun had gone down and we're playing and no lights are on, by the way. So we're just literally using our phones. (laughs) That's how bad it was to see the hole. You know, lo and behold, we're walking off the nine and and my buddies and I are laughing. We're having, we had a great round. Well, they had a great round. I had a subpar round. As we're walking off, I literally kicked this club and I thought, well, that's weird. And so we shine the light and it's this putter looking thing. And what it is, is it's a chipper. So you can yeah. chip from the French and it, but it looks like a putter. You know what I'm talking about? Yeah. I was nice. I went back the next morning and I, I said, Hey, we found this last night on the ninth hole. You guys were already closed. Wanted to bring it back. I don't know whose club it is. You know, wanted to do the right thing. The guy, old timer in there. What's your name, son? <laughs> I was like, well, dad, um, Neil Matthews. <laughs> and, and he goes, great. We'll put your name on it in 48 hours. If nobody comes and claims it, call me back and it's yours. That's how this works. And he goes, that's how it works. And I was like, well, gosh, thanks, Jad. You're so great. 
<laughs> and so sure enough, I called. I actually waited a couple more days. By the end of the week, I called back old timer answers and he's like, oh yeah, your club's here for you. I was like, my club? He goes, well, yeah, nobody's claimed it. It's yours. I have used that thing ever since. So talk about being on the fringe wow. or maybe in an area where yes. I'm like, do I really want to try this, the wedge here? Do I not? I use it a lot and it has saved me more times than I can count. That's impressive. That's pretty cool. Yeah, I, I'm a terrible golf. I, I'm the same way. I'm, I'm <laughs> like, I pretend to be a good one. I can play the part, but I'm relatively horrible. Well, I just thought it was relevant to what we're going to talk about. It is. You know, the idea of playing the part, the idea of looking the role, the idea of, again, yeah. I can look like a PGA Tour star, but I think the idea is, is I'm hiding behind the yeah. fact that I'm still 100%. playing at a par three course. Help me with this. So it is Missouri. We did get that right. It is. Do you know if it is the show me state? I, I can't remember. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, that's still very much the case in Missouri. Show us what you mean before we take you seriously. I also thought it was kind of relevant to your situation. Mm hmm. Show me who you are. Show me oh, who yeah. you're truly trying to be. My wife would absolutely, when going through this, I don't know how else, crisis situation we went through in our life, she absolutely wanted me to show her that I was a different person before we were able to rebuild our marriage. We will get to that momentarily, my yes. friend with the same name. So here we are. We love to lead off every show with this question. And that's, this is Neil. So weird to say, because I always think I'm talking <laughs> third person already. Right. Neil, help me with this. What size shoes do you wear? 11. All right. I'm loving it because I can fit in that. That's awesome. With uh, okay. with that, we're, we're on the same level. 10 and a half, maybe even sometimes, depending on the shoe. I'll even be more specific. So probably like if it's a definitely 11 for a running shoe, because I, I run a lot, it gives me a little bit of extra room in there for for that 10 and a half bowling shoe. That's weird. I am the same. And I used to run as well. And I'm trying to get back into it. So here's the accountability portion of the show. So please send encouraging messages along the way. Neil, are you sticking to your running program? I did couch to 10K and I've missed some days. <laughs> Let's just say that. I need to catch up again. Just keep at it, man. I've been running for a long time. And so my, my body's given out on me from running. So I've turned into more of a walker slash runner, which is sort of hard for me to come to grips with, but I'm slowly getting there. There. I mean, for me, was like that's my that's part of my mental therapy is, is getting out there and exercising and getting away from all this electronic stuff. Except when you take the AirPods with you. Hey, but I'm listening to good stuff. That's true. That's I true. Am. Man, I feel like we should just be friends automatically. I'm feeling the same vibe. So then getting into running shoes, I'm, I'm sure you're kind of maybe like me. Are you a snob when it comes to brands? And if so, what brand is the best or the worst? Or what are you wearing brand wise? Glad you brought this up because I've been thinking a lot about this lately. And I, so you're going to talk me off the ledge on this. <laughs> <clears throat> I've been wearing Brooks running shoes for the past five, six, seven years, like a long time. But they just served me up an ad for June. And you can see where this is going. A special kind of shoe for the month of June. Now I'm not sure whether I want to participate with their brand mm. going forward. Mm. So I'm thinking about it. I love that shoe. I got to be honest. The thing is, though, I could look at every company. That's, that's unfortunately right. There's nobody that is going to line up 100% to probably anybody's value. So you sort of just have to, I think, use the best judgment. And they they really weren't like totally in my face. So as I'm talking th this through with you now, <laughs> I can think I feel like I can give them another chance. Well, I've never been a Bud Light guy, so don't have to worry about that. Never yeah. really been into beer. Target, getting a yeah. lot of press on that as well. Ford, getting a lot of press on that. North Face, yeah. not a marketing expert. I wanted to be PR kind of guy, but I'm thinking, man... This is not going to go well. If enough people get on board, they're like, well, they can't boycott us all. I'm an A6 guy when I was running. Um, okay. I still am an A6 guy when I run. However, when I'm just for fashion, fashionistas out there, or when I'm trying to make an impression, I will wear Jordan all day long and twice <laughs> on Sunday. Wow. Now, I know you were on my good friend, Bleeding Daylight, yeah. Rodney's show. And to me... That's exciting already because Rodney, let me just tell you right now, could read the phone book to me. <laughs> he could just start an A and work through Z or even some of the ads or just, you know, if, maybe if I ever get an audio book together, when we finally finish the book that we've been kind of sort of hitting around about for a lot of years, I want Rodney, I think, to read the book. That's a great idea. Uh, audio wise. Yeah. Just has such a tremendous talent, such a tremendous voice. And I have always gravitated towards those with the Australian accent because he is from Australia. I don't think he's a fantastic human being. If you guys aren't listening to Bleeding Daylight, what is your problem? You need to be on board with that and go do that. He was on with us and we were on with him. So just want to say thanks to Ronnie on that for having you on. But back to you. Why, why on earth for you 
to have this great unmasking. And and that's what I think mm-hmm. gravitated me towards you was your book and, and all that. And we'll get to that yeah. momentarily. Why write a book about the most traumatic event in your life? Why why do those things? And, and why come unmasked in those moments? I gave you a lot there. So take take your pick. I mean, that's a great question. It's, it's interesting because the book came very quickly. My unmasking, if you will, happened in the spring of 2020. And by spring of 2021, I've got a book in hand and I'm ready to go shop it around. I still think I was out in front of God on the book part, not on telling my story part. What I've learned since my unmasking involves pornography and sexual integrity, man, there are a lot of dudes are caught in this. A lot of people in the church that I've found that I've suddenly come across are dealing with this and struggling with this. God broke me free in an instant, which is I know doesn't happen all the time on your addictions. He broke me free from this addiction clean in one fell swoop. And I ask every day, like, why? Why did you break this from me when everyone else is struggling with it? I don't know if I have the right answer necessarily, but I know part of the answer is you need to tell people about it. You need to tell people that I'm still working out here, that miracles do happen. They may not be big and giant as, you you know, you're reading in the Bible, I'm still changing people's lives and you need to help people see that and be that and show them what's going on. So Neil, help me with this then. What was the breaking point? What was the point where it, when it all kind of the, the dam yeah. broke loose, if you will, the floodgates opened, whatever it may be, how long had you been struggling? And then what, what broke it? First got exposed to porn at, at the age of nine and I'm now 53. So I had about a 40 year struggle with pornography in, in elementary school in third grade. There was this little wooded area behind my school that we could ride our bikes to on the floor of this forest. There were these little ripped up pages of Playboy magazine and we'd call it the Playboy forest. And that's where I first got exposed to pornography. And from that moment on, it has sort of grabbed hold of my heart and my mind. It didn't let go. Once I got older and had more resources, more money, pornography wasn't enough for me to satisfy the hole in my heart. I had to look for other stuff. Some of my family issues had trouble with love, just connecting with people. So I ended up part of my adult life paying women for sex, finding them online. Led me to a hotel room in Chicago in February of 2020. I was on a business trip, met a, a woman I had met online, paid her for coming to her hotel room. As I was leaving the hotel room, the bedroom door opens up, the second bedroom door in that room opens up and out comes a rather large gentleman dressed in drag, looks like a offensive lineman from the Chicago Bears. In his hand, he held up his phone, which had my wife's contact information on there. And he said, you're going to pay us more money or we're going to call your wife. Now, I'd been doing this quite a while. So, and I put myself in situations looking back now, like I'm surprised nothing sinister has happened to me sooner. It finally caught up with me that day. And I did whatever it took to get out of that room, which was about $900 got out the door, sprinted down the hallway to the elevator. and But I could hear the door open up back behind me. They're yelling, hey, you need to pay us more money or we're going to call your wife. I got out of the hotel and this is, you know, this is where my the mask came into play. I had all these business meetings set up the rest of the day. Nobody knew what was going on. I put my mask on tight, shoved all those feelings that just happened down below. Like I went on my day and nobody knew. Nobody knew I was just blackmailed by a prostitute in a hotel room in downtown Chicago. Here's Neil, the nice businessman, about as clean and clean cut as as you could possibly imagine. Went throughout the day. They didn't call back. My wife picked me up from the airport when I came back that night. They hadn't called her yet. So I'm thinking, ah, this is great. I'm going to be free and clear. They were just, they got what they wanted out of me. They're moving on. But then about three days later, would have been March 1st, 2020, 9.30 p.m. at night. I'm working in my office. My phone starts blowing up. It's text messages from this couple. And again, they're saying, hey, you've got 15 minutes to pay us or we're going to call your wife. And at that point, I was like, well, I don't, I'm not paying them any more money. I just kind of like, I don't even know what I'm thinking, just like, maybe they're just going to get bored and move on. On. They certainly have to have other marks. I'm sure I'm no, I'm not the first person they've done this to. So they'll just get bored and move on. Well, they, they did get bored, went ahead and pulled the nuclear option. And so 15 minutes later, I heard the phone upstairs. It's my wife's phone going off. And then she comes charging downstairs, down the hall, the footsteps going louder. And uh, she barges into my my office and she's like, are you cheating on me? And I did what any good addict would do there, which was I lied. I said, this is the first time I've ever done anything like this. I never want to do it again. Really just more sorry that suddenly this mask that I had on tight for all these years and now suddenly coming loose. I was more upset about that than I was about what my wife just discovered and the pain that she's starting to go through. So that was kind of the moment that sort of started to knock things loose. But it wasn't, <laughs> that, that set off the six weeks 
of wildness. Think about it. This happens March 2020. Two weeks after my wife gets this call, COVID happens. And now suddenly we're locked in our house together. She's a hairstylist, so her business shut down for two months. I worked from home for two months. So (laughs) when we're trying to deal with this situation, she is certainly confused as heck. What happened in Chicago was the first time God hit me in the head with a two by four. It wasn't enough to knock any sense into me. I also say, at the time, I am an atheist. Did not believe in God whatsoever. In fact, I actually grew up Jewish. I was culturally Jewish, but an atheist. Six weeks after my wife gets this phone call in the middle of COVID lockdown, I'm setting up appointments with another woman who I had arrangement with back in Kansas City. This is the second time God met me with a two by four. I did it all on my laptop messaging her. Now my wife's at home, so I made 100% sure my laptop's locked. She's horrible at technology. So I knew there was no way she could figure out how to get on my laptop if it was locked. So I went to go to this appointment, but about 15 minutes down the road, my phone starts blowing up and it's Amy texting me. She has managed to unlock my computer. I don't know if it was left unlocked. I don't know what happened, but obviously God was working because my computer was unlocked and someone who was as technology illiterate as possible managed to get screenshots of my messages and started sending them to me. So I'm like, what in the heck is going on? Immediately turn around, come home. What do you say? You're busted. I'm still trying to keep this mask on. It's it's fighting. And I'm like, I don't even remember what I told her. It was all just a bunch of junk, lies. And she wasn't buying any of it, rightly so. Before we went to bed that night, she said, Neil, if you want to save this marriage, you need to ask God for help. That's the only way you're going to be able to do this. Went to bed that night. Woke up uh, the next morning. Amy was gone. She was obviously blowing off some steam. So I went to drive around. I'm laying there in bed. So I'm like, well, this is about as good as time as any to ask God for help. And that's what I did. The first time in my life I prayed and I said, God, I don't, I don't know what's going on. The world is collapsing. I have nowhere else to turn here. If you are out there, please let me know. There's a way out. There's hope. And as soon as I finished that prayer, the garage door popped up and it was Amy. And Amy really is the key to this whole story. She came upstairs. I told her that I prayed. I told her that I really wanted to work on our marriage and get help. She was very confused, still very reluctant, but you know, she, you know, she agreed that, you know, that we'll continue to keep talking. So later that afternoon, finally, Amy received a message from a gentleman saying, do you know a Neil Getzlow? Neither of us knew who it was. It turned out to be the ex-boyfriend of someone else I had been in an arrangement with, and he was getting ready to send her all the receipts. Before that even happened, before he knew who he was, I had this overwhelming feeling that I needed to confess everything to Amy. I sat her down and I told her what I'd been doing for the previous eight years of our marriage, which is looking at pornography extensively, buying women online. Like I talk about it in the book, like when you're getting ready to throw up, you can feel it working up through your chest and out your mouth and he just blah. And that's what I did all over the floor of our marriage. I just threw up, but I felt so much better. For the first time in 40 years, I was not carrying around this baggage. I took the mask off and it felt so good. Like I'm waiting for the right hook because I had no concept of what Amy was going to do next. What she did absolutely changed our lives. She looked at me and she said, Neil, Jesus forgave me for my sins. How can I not forgive you for yours? I forgive you. That was the moment that my life changed. Amy's forgiveness, but that was also Jesus working through Amy to forgive me. What happened was three months after we had gotten married, Amy found Jesus. So here's Amy telling a atheist slash Jewish man, oh, I found Jesus. No idea what that meant. All I knew is from my Jewish background, which was basically we didn't, we had no connection to God. We didn't read the New Testament. I had no idea what it meant. All you know, you hear about born again Christians, the worst thing in your mind that you can think, that was what I was thinking. She's gone crazy. So we had to deal with that for for eight years. So when she offered me that forgiveness, I was like, that was the moment I had not looked at pornography since that day. It was April 14th, 2020. It has absolutely changed our lives. I gave my life to Christ shortly after that. It's hard to believe sometimes. I have been on this journey myself. I lost a ministry. So I was actually an associate pastor when I succumbed to the the temptation. And listen, it wasn't the first time. And there have been many lies along the way in my almost 22-year marriage with my wife. I know those lies. We probably have the same lies or same type of lies as far as justifying what we did. I never went to that extreme where I was out. Oh, yeah. Meeting ladies in another city or on business trips or anything like that. Yeah. 
That seemed too far. However, I have had people through the years, not only on the show, away from the show, do the same struggle that you've walked into. Or I again, I want to applaud your honesty. I want to applaud your your willingness to share this with a total stranger. And I'm glad that that doesn't have any power over you any longer. Doesn't it really doesn't? I know people are surprised by that too. I'm living a sinless, not sinless life. There are other things in my life. The anger is still there. Impatience, idolatry, like that stuff is still percolating and simmering. I'm working on it. Sexual sin, man, he knocked it out of me good. I know you probably can't per se put yourself in Amy's shoes, but let's try for a second. Absolutely. What do you think she really felt? She ever asked details of how many girls there were? Did she, I mean, I'm sure you got into the nitty gritty of that great reveal. My question, you know, nothing's off limits. How the heck does she have sex with you again? On the first question, she became a detective. In her gut, she knew something was going on over the years, just by the way I acted. So she knew something was happening. She absolutely became a detective. She became a forensic scientist going through my phone. She didn't have the password to my phone. I would take the phone with me everywhere. Like literally, if I was going to take a shower, I was like, oh, I got to charge my phone. So I, there was no opportunity for her to even attempt to get onto that phone. She went through it with a fine tooth comb and she found things on there that I thought I had, didn't even realize were still on there. Yes, she asked very detailed questions about who and where and when and what did you do? And these questions went on for a good six to nine months. And it's one of those things where I had to I had to stand in the line of fire and take it. So your second part too, but I want to say this, Amy's forgiveness was more for her sake than it was for mine. It unlocked the bitterness. And then it kind of ties into how you said, well, how can she have sex with me again? I mean, she truly forgave me. Again, it didn't take away the hurt and that stuff that we had to work through. It didn't give the bitterness a chance to form. Also, what it didn't do was it did not absolve me of any accountability or any responsibility for my actions. Absolutely, 100% not. I had to prove to her by my walk consistently that I was a changed man. After a while, we were able to rebuild that trust. It took a lot of work. We went to counseling for over a year to talk through it. Having God in the center of our relationship is a huge thing that changed everything. Back to that question about how could she still be with me? That would be hard to try to get over, try to imagine mentally, just imagining your partner with somebody else. Time obviously helps. The fact that she could see the fruits of my salvation being produced in front of her eyes, that helps. Especially the first year or so, we would drive by places and she'd be like, did you take someone there? Did you meet someone there? Things that would, would trigger those feelings for her. We're walking through this in some respect with some friends. My wife, she looked at me one day in the car and she said, it's over if that happens. I just want to let you know, if you ever go that far, I don't know if I can come back from that. Not that Amy's a saint. I think some ladies right now would probably right now in this moment say, Amy, you are crazy. And she got that. Girlfriend, you need to come have have a girl's weekend, spa day. I think most ladies right now, most wives, most women right now are like, you are cray cray girl. How could you take this guy back? Amy's story is even more powerful than, than mine, honestly, because of that very thing. The fact that she could forgive, like truly forgive and want to rebuild this marriage. And yes, she did have friends in her life that I know that have walked away from her because she decided to stay. I know we've had the opportunity to share our testimony in front of our church. A lot of people, a lot of men come to me saying, I'm struggling with pornography. And she's had some women come to her saying, my husband is dealing with this. What do I do? Something that I wake up every morning and and thank God for. Like, how can I not? Thank you for breaking me from, from this addiction. And thank you for giving me Amy, putting Amy in my life. Proverbs 18 says, when a man finds a wife, he finds a treasure, favor from the Lord. If Amy didn't offer me that forgiveness, what what does our life look like today? We're divorced. I'm probably dead. I'm careening so hard into the ground that I would have died, done something stupid to get myself killed. She doesn't do this. It doesn't even feel like real sometimes. <laughs> you know, do you think I think about it? Because it was only three years ago. Three years ago, I was doing all of this. And now today, I'm reading the Bible every day. I'm getting up and watching sermons online. I'm filling my life up with God in a way that doesn't make any sense. If you knew the old Neil, you'd say, this is Looney Tunes. One of the guys I I really respect, his writing style at least, he wrote these lyrics down. He says, 30 years of running, 30 years of searching, 30 years of hurting, 30 years of pain, 30 years of fearful, 30 years of anger, 30 years of empty, 30 years of anguish, 30 years of hopelessness, 30 years of thirsting, 
30 years of later, 30 years of fake, 30 years of hollow, 30 years of shallow, 30 years of darkness, 30 years of baggage, 30 years of sadness. And he says, 30 years of bitterness, 30 years of pushing everyone away. Was that you? Yes, that was me. This is part of the reason why I tell this story for a couple of reasons. First of all, I want men to know what you're doing is not healthy. Pornography is poison and it's poison in your mind. It's the symptom of something else that's gone badly in your life, like it was for me. I talked to a counselor coming out of this and he asked me this really interesting question. He's like, what is the first thing you had to learn how to do as a little kid? It kind of stopped me for a second. I had never contemplated that. And the first thing that popped into my mind. I had to learn how to be alone. I was a typical latchkey kid of the 80s. My parents got divorced. I moved into an apartment with my mom. We moved away from the school that was literally 20 steps away from my backyard to having to ride the bus. All my friends were at this school. I knew nobody at this new school. This apartment complex we moved into, there were no kids there. I had to learn how to be alone. On either side of my mom's bed, there were these two nightstands. They were full of Playboy and Penthouse magazines. So now she's at work 40 hours a week. I'm home alone at 12, 13 years old. What am I supposed to do? That's how I filled up that loneliness. And as I got older, it almost became like a self-fulfilling prophecy. It was a shame side. I'd look at pornography. I'd feel good for a moment, but then I'd be like, oh man, like I can't believe I did that. This is why nobody loves me. This is why I'm all alone. I'd have this hole in my heart. Then I have to look at the porn again to get filled up. And it would just spin around and around and manifest itself in all kinds of different ways over the years. It was also a self-inflicted loneliness when I got older. As a typical male, I had zero communication skills. Even though that's what I went to college, for as a communication degree, journalism degree, could not talk to the people in my life. That's why I had this mask on for so long because I said, I didn't tell anybody about anything that I'd ever done. Even though I was married, I was still lonely because I wasn't talking. I wasn't sharing my life with my wife. And that's part of the other reason why I want to tell this story and for, especially for wives, but I want to be an advocate for men, meaning not that we deserve any sympathy or any sort of plaudits for coming out and talking about addictions and, and pornography and all that stuff. For the majority of men that are looking at pornography, there is a brokenness there. That's why they're doing it. They don't want to do it. They want help. They don't know how to talk about it. They don't know how to break free from it. For whatever reason, their heart is not aligned with Christ to help them do that in a way that makes a difference. Talk about your wife who would say, I'm not doing that thing. It did that. And I would just challenge, put on the other person's shoes, the shoes that the men are standing in while they are <laughs> badly smelling shoes, right? But they are broken and hurt, stuck in a world that doesn't want them to be men anymore. Again, it doesn't absolve anybody of any responsibility at all. Find that common ground, then there is chance for healing. There are so many men still caught in this vortex. They don't want to be free. They're like, well, I'll just continue to live my life this way. It'll be fine. And it's like, no, there's there's so much more. All right. So this guy that I actually have met, his signature is actually just the, just above us in the, in the background there. You can't see it on the camera probably. Maybe you know him too, attributed to saying that I think are, are relevant to what we're talking about right now. So the first one is this and I wanted to get your feedback on. I remember the hugs of the players long after I remember cutting down the nets. Do you know who said that? I know there's lots of people that could have said I mean, that. But there's a guy named Roy Williams. I don't know if you know him at all. Okay, so uh, we're going we're gonna to have to take a detour for real quick before we <laughs> come back to this because you're drinking out of your North Carolina mug. <laughs> Can you see this? I did. That's why I brought it up. I went to KU. Oh, rock, sock, a Jayhawk. I started at KU at the same time Roy Williams did. So he is, he is the man. And yes, I, I cried. I literally cried when he left KU to go to North Carolina. Well, you know, he did say on CBS, he doesn't give an F about Carolina. So there is that. And then two days and later, then he, left. he became our coach. And yeah. he left. So sports used to be a huge idol for me. Still, like I still love mm. sports, but I definitely have had to pull back a little bit and get a sense of reality. But man, he was the best sports figure that I can remember that I've had an opportunity to just watch him and how he acts. Pretty awesome. But he talks about these hugs, yeah. right? Long after they cut the nets down, like that's more important to him yeah. is the relationship with the players mm -hmm. than, than ever cutting down the nets. And, and to help, if you're not a sports enthusiast, you might be a little lost in this moment. When you win the championship in basketball, a lot of times they have a thing, a ceremony where they literally cut down the net. I know that sounds weird and goofy. I don't know where it came from. So don't ask me 
that. When I hear this quote, and I'm going to morph it a little bit, maybe so it's more applicable to us. I want my wife to remember my hugs long after she remembers my achievements. Mm. And I, I would venture to say that's probably true of you. Is again, Neil, our name, I'm going to say ours because it, yeah. it is yours. It is mine. Yes. Neil actually means champion. Yes, it does. I do remember seeing that somewhere. When I've struggled as a child hmm. with the name Neil, well, first off, I've always hated it. I don't know if people know that or not. I've always hated it. I wanted to be Doug. I was Patrick. Neil means champion. Hmm. My second name, so my middle name is Alan, and it means handsome. Hmm. And then Matthew is my last name. There's no real definition or meaning. The closest they can find is Matthew. So I'm a champion that's handsome, that's sent from God. Wow. To date, I've never won a championship except in soccer when I was eight, and I really didn't contribute to the championship team. Second, handsome. I've never considered myself a very handsome dude. Like, I look at the Patrick Swayze's of the world going your 80s route, the Tom Cruise's, the Anthony Edwards, the, the Val Kilmer's. And I'm like, I'm not any of those guys. I'm not Rambo. I'm not Chuck Norris. I'm like, well, I'm not handsome, God, so what's going on there? Sent from God? Like, oh, I don't, I struggle with that. By looking in the mirror, I'm not seeing Jesus. I see the broken man who still could be so much better, better father, being a better husband, being a better overall man, I do tend to focus the mistakes than I do on the victories. A pastor that I talked to gave me some great advice, which would have been great had I had four years earlier. He said, hey, look, if you're struggling with pornography and or whatever it might be, and you go six days without looking, and then the seventh, you mess up. He's like, well, you're six and one that week. That's a pretty good record. Most sports teams will take being six and one in a in a week, and you you do that over time, and you're gonna be you're, you're gonna get to where you want to be, and be intentional and remind myself not that I'm looking back at my old life and reminiscing. Just thinking, hey, where where was I on April 13th, 2020? And where was I on April 15th, 2020? It is a completely brand new life. I know Amy, I know that she is grateful that she has a new husband. We've been married basically for three years, not not the 11, 11 years that we just celebrated recently. It's been three years. It's been awesome. It's not like our lives are that much better in terms of we still have the same amount of money, We same house, same cars, living in the same area. All that stays the same, but what's different? Well, the fact that we are now walking together, both as followers of Christ, I wouldn't trade that for anything. It made such a huge difference for our marriage the past three years. He said just the, the hugs, which I'll just say, like it's the smaller stuff about life. This weekend, we didn't do anything. It was still awesome at the same time. We went to dinner with friends and we walked around market area in Kansas City. Like we did basic stuff, but we were together. I'd rather do that than anything else. I think it's the little things, those hugs that we'll, we should be remembered for not our achievements. Yeah. All right. Another one from our great Roy Williams, yes. just because I feel like I need to bring this one up too. It says, and I, this is one of my favorites probably that he has been attributed to saying, it says the name on the front of our Jersey, North Carolina, or in your case, Kansas yes. is more important than the name on the back of the Jersey. So again, if we were to put a name on the, on the front of your Jersey, you said it was an idol in your it life, was. which some would probably push on that for me. There is a North Carolina Ram on my <laughs> arm right now. So literally take in the brand, if somebody were to put a name on your jersey, what name, what team do you think you would be playing for? I mean, it seems like an easy layup here. So here you are. Jesus, that is the name that I want on the front and the back. That's who I'm playing for today. It's not about me. It really isn't anymore. I want to be more generous with my thoughts and be less selfish. I do represent Jesus here in this world. And that is who I play for. And that's my coach. And that's what it is. That was an easy one, man. <laughs> <laughs> well, I had to give you an easy one. I, I felt like, you know, we had a lot of hard ones. And we so, did. A little layup there. This is something I've given thought to staying with a the sports theme. So in July of 2019, my favorite hockey team, the St. Louis Blues, won the Stanley Cup. February of 2020, my favorite football team, the Kansas City Chiefs, won the Super Bowl. Then COVID hits, sports world shut down, locked down. Basically, God said to me, I'm going to take away everything that you love. I'm going to take away your sports. I'm going to take away your porn. I'm going to take away going out and getting drunk or high with your friends. I'm taking it all away. For the next six months, you've got nothing to do but focus on me and focus on your wife. What are you going to do? God shows you the way out. Still have free will. I did not have to listen to those things that he was putting in me and he laid out a path for me to take. I didn't have to take it. Once I started taking the steps, how can 
I not? This is the roadmap I wish I would have paid attention to 30 years ago, all laid out in the Bible. Going through Proverbs, how am I 50 years old and just now realizing this stuff? Hey, you know, a better late than never. That's why I'm very public about this. I want to give hope to those that may be the same age who maybe are falling away from God or don't know God. You can still change your life. It is not too late. There's still plenty to live for. I think that is the key to all of this is how much longer are you going to wait? I was at a wedding DJ and it was out in the middle of nowhere. And for us, that is saying something because in Oregon, it's pretty rural out here. And there are some spots that it can get a little dicey. I mean, you probably remember national news a number of years back. There was actually a family not from our area get off on this road, this access road, and they ended up dying. So I say that as I was leaving this wedding at like 10 o'clock at night, no no road signs, no lights, no street lights, literally just me and nature. Well, instead of going right, I actually went left, not realizing it. And I start driving and I'm driving and I'm driving and I'm driving and I'm driving. And I'm like, why haven't I hit the freeway yet? Why haven't I hit the way I came in? Why haven't, oh, I'm sure it's just around this bend. Nope. I'm sure it's just around this bend. Nope. I look at the clock. I'd been driving for almost 45 minutes in the wrong direction. <laughs> and finally I was like, you know, I'm having this conversation. I'm a little frustrated. I'm like, God, I'm tired. I've been here all day DJing. There's energy level that is now depleted. Like I'm out. And I finally was like, I'm just going to turn around. There was such a pride in turning around. There was such a moment of my life where I was like, I, I, no, I am going the right way. I am doing this correctly. I, I am not this stupid. I know how I came into this place. I, I know how I got here. What is my problem? And finally, I'm not kidding you. I, and no radio, by the way. Because it's just nothing but static. Could have connected my phone, but I was so afraid to try to like pull over, connect my phone. I'm like, well, this is dumb. Just And in the quiet and in the still, God's like, are you really ready to turn around? That is the voice that I hear. And as I turn around, I don't know what I'm doing. I don't even know if turning around is going to help any. And I turn around and I start driving again. Nothing. And then finally, I get a glimmer of my cell phone reception waking up. Oh my God, I can access <laughs> GPS now. Plug that in there. I had to have gone almost an hour out of the way. And I thought to myself, why did it take an hour for me to finally say, turn around? Why do you think it took you so long to finally say, I'm going to turn around? I wanted to do it my way. I was selfish. I thought I knew everything. I thought I had all the answers and I thought I could hide behind this mask forever, live the, the life that I was leading. Didn't know any better. We are made to be connected to other people. We are made to have these relationships with other brothers and sisters in Christ. I had no concept of what that meant. Prided myself on the fact that I was an introvert. I wore that as a badge of honor. Honor, quiet and moody and, and all that stuff. My, I thought, you know, look, I'm doing pretty well in my life. I must be doing things right. I never had any concept of, of any of that. Thinking that I'm an atheist, well, who else, whose other knowledge am I going to lean on? It's going to be my own. Sadly mistaken. I love that analogy. Plugged in the GPS, rerouted me. Once I took that first step in the right direction, God rewards you. You're just one step away from, from finding that favor from God if you just take that step. That's what I had to learn how to do. So the next day is church because the wedding was on Saturday. And so one of my friends who, who I respect greatly, he said, hey, man, what time did you get home? I don't know. It was after midnight. What time did you leave? And I said, I don't remember what time I left. And he said, because here's the thing. I was so embarrassed to admit to anyone that I'd gone an hour out of the way. Mm. When I got home, my wife said, what took you so long to get home? You should have been home a while back. What what time did you leave? And I was like, I, I don't know. I don't even want to talk about it. And she said, I don't understand. Like, why are you mad? You seem mad right now. Why are you mad? And I said, I am mad. I'm freaking pissed. And she said, well, what happened? And I said, I turned the wrong direction and I went probably about an hour out of the way. And she said, oh, you did? For real? And I was like, yes, I'm mad. Okay, let's move on. Let's go to bed. I'm really tired. I have to get up for church tomorrow. So this is now Saturday night again, or really Sunday morning, because, you know, it's like midnight. And she's like, babe, when I was leaving, I, I went the wrong direction too. And I was like, what? Yeah, you know how they had those flags up? And, and I, I went down an access road and I was like, this is not the right way. I, I thought I was going down somebody's driveway. And I was like, wait a minute, you went the wrong way too? She goes, well, yeah, it was really dark out there. I know. <laughs> Believe me, I know how much comfort it was for me. Because here I am beating myself up along that road. I'm stupid. I'm, I'm thinking of all these people that were at the wedding that found their way home. And I'm literally naming them by name. Like, well, so-and-so probably found their way. Like, what's your problem, Neil? So-and-so got back on the path. What's your problem? Like, why can't you do that? And then to get home and the person that I love probably most in this world outside of my daughter says to me, babe, I, I went the wrong way too. 
If anybody can take something away from what you're saying today, there is somebody who has been down that road who can say, listen, I don't know you, but I'm here with a hug and a word of encouragement to say, it can be done. It can be over today. So Neil, help us with this. Where can folks get the book? Where's the best place? Where? How can someone connect with you? All that fun stuff that we like to do. Yeah, you just go to go to my website, neilgetslow.com, N-E-I-L-G-E-T-Z-L-O-W.com. You can go there. You can pick up a copy of the book and email me through the website. You can find my social media. You know, I encourage you, if you have questions, please don't hesitate to reach out. I'd love to connect and talk. I'm also donating 50% of sales from the book to Run to Stop It, which is an organization that's fighting against sex trafficking in the US. They donate 100% of their proceeds generated to anti-sex trafficking organizations in the US. We're very passionate about that. If you even buy it through my website, I'll even put my autograph in the book for you. How about that? That's awesome, man. I, I love that. And I love the fact that there's a cause behind the book. I love that you're doing that too. That That's cool stuff. Well, and, and just real quick, Run to Stop It is an organization that my, my church set up. It's, I'll just leave you with this last nugget. Like of all the churches that I could have been dropped into in this world, I am dropped into a church where the pastor gets on stage and talks about pornography and talks about sex trafficking and talks about the dangers of it all. Like of all the places I could have been sent to, God sent me right into the middle of it. What I didn't realize before, what I do realize now, it's really, it weighs on my heart. At the same time, I'm glad I was, I found the truth is that, you know, most of the women that I had visited, they're against their will. Whether they were legitimately trafficked, I talked to a sex trafficking survivor who said poverty was her pimp. She was there because of the money. So that was what was driving her. Like, so there's like, nobody's there really on doing it because it is something they want to do. And same with pornography. Clicking on those links, you are contributing to sex trafficking in some way, form or fashion. Sobering thought for me. No, I I think that's important to remember. You mentioned that you were older than I am. I I think you got me by 10 years or so because I'm I'm 43 and you're... Okay, 53, yeah. Yeah, so you got me by 10 years. So, you know, in your old age, yes, you probably forgot one other place that they can get the book that we're going to actually highlight and put on. So it's okay. I mean, old age is probably setting in you might want to get that looked at. I don't know. There is this place called OPSpodcast.com. They can actually click on under books that I love. Yours will be up towards the top. You forgot Ooh. that, right? Yeah, I did, man. Yeah, that it's is, okay. That's probably the best, one of the better places to go. Of course. But here's the thing, though, is it's not at the tippy top because it can't be above the Carolina Way by Dean Smith. <laughs> and it definitely cannot be above Roy Williams' book. So it'll be kind of sort of okay. below those two. Is that is that all right, though? I think that'll be just fine. Um, okay. I, I don't know if I should be above <laughs> those guys. Both Kansas guys, by the way. I know, right? That's awesome. So how crazy would that be to see on a website your book next to those two? There isn't. It doesn't make any sense to me. None of this makes any sense to me, but um, <laughs> I can't wait to ask God what what he was thinking during all this. I want to be next to you when that happens. So hopefully yeah. hopefully he just goes by name order, not last name order. So we'll be kind of near each other. All the Neil's yeah, over in this together. corner in heaven, right? We'd be in that group together. I love it. Neil, let's end on some silliness. You talked about a lot of seriousness. Let's end on some silliness. Now, listen, I tried really hard in preparation of you coming on today to find a Kansas City Chiefs Cup no. and, um, and I couldn't. And then somebody again did send me a note that you were a Jayhawks fan. So I think it's only fitting we do my silliness in my North Carolina cup. Okay. So this is a just silliness we end the show with. It's called senseless. So, uh, so here we are. I'm going to roll for you. There is a die in here. Cause I'm guessing you didn't bring a die. I know you brought a cup, but, brought a cup, but no, but no, but, but no, no, die. no, no die. Okay. All right, good. So I'm going to roll for you if you're okay with that. Sure. You got a number six. Is it six or nine? It is a six, actually. Okay. Yeah, it's a six number die. So it's a six. Yeah, I guess that it, would make sense. It's it's a uh, it's a light blue die even. So, I like it. Okay. Yeah, it's a North Carolina die. It's from Yahtzee. Sort of stole it from them. Anyway, here we are. Number six is this. It's six o'clock. What's for dinner? I think burgers on the grill, probably for dinner at six o'clock tonight. That's awesome. Is there a certain thing that has to be on a burger no matter what? You know, I am pretty boring when it comes to my toppings. So it's just, it's pretty generic. Ketchup, mustard, lettuce, tomato, onions, but not outrageous or anything. Still need to learn how to grill a better burger. I got some opportunity there. And now is it a flat burger? It's not like a smash burger. It's, it's more of a thicker burger, but sometimes I tend to, I'm not working with like a really fancy grill either. So if they, 
if Weber's not them, baiting down your door. Like it's the very uneven heating surface. Sometimes you'll get a burned one and sometimes you get one that could use a little bit more heat. Well, Neil, I, I want to say thank you. Yeah, I want to say you. thank you for coming on, man. I really appreciate what you shared. I really appreciate you letting us dig in. The last thing I want to end with though, and help me with this because I really yeah. wanted to get this in. Hardest part about the book to write was? Probably having to, there was a chapter in there about shame. My mom's involvement with that, probably the hardest part. There's still some healing there that needs to happen. I've forgiven her, but sometimes you still have some work to do like that. Those old feelings still come up at times. That probably was the hardest part is having to write. Like I'm not trying to throw her under the bus. Like, it, But that's the other thing too, right? That I realized you got to stop pointing the fingers at other people. That's the, the one thing I had to learn quickly. Like this, yes, I had these issues growing up. Ultimately, at the end of the day, the finger of responsibility comes pointing right back at you. I had to own up to that and take accountability and responsibility. And, and once I was able to do that, put Christ first in my life, man, yes, life changing. Absolutely. Well, that's awesome, man. All right, guys and gals, kids and campers alike. I don't know about anybody else. That's tough. That is a tough, 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 tough pill to swallow. And I just want to say that I applaud Neil's efforts. I wholeheartedly do. So here's my question for you as we jump on out of here today. And that's this. What are you hiding behind? What are you staying in the dark with? Are you locked alone in the closet? Who gets the privilege of knowing the real authentic you? And are you willing to share it? Because if you're not, why not? What is stopping you? What is holding you back? What are you so afraid of? Are you like me? Are you traveling down that road hoping that maybe you're going to find the freeway and maybe life is just going to get easier and it's it's going to be fine? You want to stay there? Okay, fine. You can stay there. But how much damage is going to be done along the way if you continue to stay there? How much life are you missing out on right now because of the choices you continue to make? Now, listen, these are the same things I've said to myself for years. My dad said to me once, and it's only been a few times. He said, you know, I gave you two things in this world. He said, I gave you your name and I gave you your last name. Don't mess either of them up. So I want to challenge you today as we get out of here with this thought. What are you going to do with this? What are you going to do with what you heard today? What will you do with it? Let me know. I'd love to hear. OPSpodcast.com is a great place to let me know. You, of course, can listen anytime there. It's on demand. You can go back and listen to many of our amazing episodes. And of course, you can connect with us on the social medias at OPS Podcast Show under Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. And again, before we go, don't forget, remember this always. Remember when you walk in other people's shoes, you really do get a different perspective on life. Thank you so much for listening and stay tuned till next week when we walk in other people's shoes.